Hey guys, this is a video summary of our week four lecture on lifestyle, dietary fat, and its effects on insulin resistance. Um, I just want to put this up to highlight the main points so that you can go over this at your leisure. So the main things that we talked about in class um, and what I want to gear this week towards are to pick up the metformin lifestyle debate from last week and look at exactly how they work with respect to insulin resistance. So how do exercise and metformin work? Next, we want to move into can we manipulate dietary fat and will that change insulin resistance? Um, can we explain why it changes insulin resistance through changes in DAG or ceramides? Um, and then, can we glean some information from that to see whether or not DAGs and ceramides are the whole story? They've been our bad guys up until now, but maybe we're barking up the wrong tree. So the first major thing that we saw in lecture this week is when we use metformin and exercise, we get improvements in whole body fasting insulin and glucose. So at a whole body level, it seems like both of them are able to improve insulin sensitivity, but this study that we looked at showed that exercise only not metformin, was able to improve muscle glucose uptake. So muscle insulin sensitivity, not whole body. Basal insulin stimulated glucose uptake was not different in any of these groups, and we went over in detail what each of these bars means in class. As soon as you add insulin to the mix, though, you see a progressive impairment in glucose uptake in those ZDF rats. Those are the high-fat diabetic rats. When you put them on a high-fat diet, the impairment's even worse. And metformin doesn't seem to do anything to correct that. What we do notice, though, is that both exercise groups were able to partially restore insulin-stimulated glucose uptake. So that's good. It seems that the reason for this is due to a decrease in DAG and ceramide content. Those are what interrupt insulin signaling. But if we look at DAGs and ceramides, they're decreased with exercise and with metformin. So it's really odd that we see this decrease in our supposed bad uh, regulators of insulin sensitivity or insulin signaling, um, but we don't see a recovery of insulin stimulated glucose uptake with the metformin group. So it's important to put it into context that we see a return of the DAG and ceramide contents back to lean levels with both metformin and exercise. So the lean group is way over on the left in the black bars um, and the DAG and ceramide content with metformin and exercise matched that group. But that's interesting too because if we see a decrease in these bad regulators of insulin signaling back to lean levels why don't we see an increase in muscle glucose uptake back to lean levels? It suggests that there's something else at play and maybe that this isn't the whole reason why glucose uptake was improved. Maybe there's something else going on in the cell. So in summary, while it seems that metformin and exercise are good at um, restoring whole body insulin sensitivity, or blunting the progression of diabetes at the whole body level, um, the effects at the muscle are really only limited to exercise. Only the groups that exercise saw improved insulin stimulated glucose uptake, but we see this decrease in our supposed negative regulators of insulin signaling, DAGs and ceramides, with both metformin and exercise. So there's a little bit of a problem we're trying to figure out now if that's the whole story. Now one part of the, the answer to this story might be that the drug seems to work on the liver mostly. There's not many effects documented in the muscle and the drug works by just supplying the muscle with less fat and less carbohydrate. It tries to not force as much fuel into the muscle and that might help clear out some of the DAGs and ceramides that are there already. Whereas exercise, we know, works at the muscle directly, and it tends to remove the bottleneck. It clears out all of the excess um, lipids, carbohydrate, and lipid breakdown products like DAGs and ceramides, 
when you do the exercise. Now, that might not be entirely correct. It doesn't clear out all of them, but it certainly uses those for fuel. And the degree to which they're cleared out will depend on the intensity and duration of exercise. So now what if we shift to looking at dietary fat? We know that high fat diets cause insulin resistance. And this first paper is going to investigate specifically saturated fatty acids. Um, it reiterates what we already know that it causes insulin resistance. But one of the main questions is to see if the uh, muscle from obese people is more sensitive to saturated fats. That is, is there already an underlying insulin resistance um, in the obese people versus leans? Now there's some adiponectin stuff in here as well, so we can compare that to last week. But the main thing that I want you guys to take out of this is the sensitivity of lean versus obese muscle. Now if we move away from saturated fats to unsaturated, why would they ever be good? Uh, the first reason why unsaturated fats are good is that when you use them to make membranes, they are much more fluid. They don't fit into the membranes as well and they disrupt the uniformity, which is a good thing. So saturated fats are all really long straight chains. They fit together really tightly in the membranes and they create essentially a brick wall which is really hard to get uh, proteins into. Um, so like receptors or transporters, it's hard for them to work that well when they're in these really tight, kind of landlocked plasma membranes. On the other hand, when you have unsaturated fatty acids that have bends in the chains, it kind of pushes the other saturated fatty acids around and it's much more fluid. So enzymes and transporters fit into the membrane a lot better. And as a general rule, Better fit equals better function. Now, why else? That can't be the whole story because we've linked DAGs and ceramides to um, impaired insulin signaling, and those aren't necessarily at the membrane. Now, what's really cool is that it seems as though fat isn't just fat. Fat's also kind of like a hormone. It can stimulate genes to turn on fat oxidation and turn down fat synthesis, um, depending on the type of fat that you're bringing in. So on the right, you can see we're using omega-3 fatty acids, the N3 PUFAs. They get into the cell. They turn on this protein called PPAR, which is defined at the bottom there. And this, this protein goes to the nucleus and starts to turn on all of these genes that are involved in fat oxidation. So it helps get rid of the fat in the muscle. At the same time, they turn off genes through SREBP1C that are involved in fat synthesis. So you get more removal, less synthesis, overall less accumulation of fat in the muscle. And the reverse is true too. When you have saturated fats, it tends to decrease oxidation and increase storage, which may exacerbate the problem. So, we didn't get to this slide on Tuesday. This kind of sets us up for the papers this week. Is there a whole body effect of omega-3 fatty acids? Like, is there any reason to go into the muscle or in any tissue and look and see if there's a mechanism at play? So this study just looked to see whether or not supplementing a diet with fish oil could improve insulin sensitivity. The other goal of this study was to see if fish oil worked through PPAR. That's it. So this graph here shows um, glucose infusion rate, which is what we use during our clamp, so it's a measure of insulin sensitivity. Remember, larger is better in this case. And on the left, you can see our wild type mice, the WT set of columns. They're, they're normal mice. On the left is the normal diet, which is a chow diet, then a high fat diet, and then a high fat with omega-3s. And so we see what we expect. With a high-fat diet, um, the glucose infusion rate goes down, so they're more insulin resistant. Then all of a sudden when we add omega-3s, nothing else is different. Insulin sensitivity is increased. So it's, insulin resistance is partially prevented, might be a better way to say it. Now over on the right-hand side, this is the same exact experiment, but with mice that don't have that PPAR protein. 
So on the last slide, we said that omega-3s work through PPAR to trans, well, to move to the nucleus and start to express genes related to fat oxidation. So we see still, with a high-fat diet in the middle bar, that insulin sensitivity goes down. But this time, when we add omega-3s, we don't get a recovery of insulin sensitivity. So without PPARs, omega-3s didn't work. Interesting. So omega-3s can improve insulin sensitivity, and they have to do it through this PPAR protein. So this gives us justification to look into the muscle and um, see what might be going on. So that's exactly what we're going to do this week. Um, I changed this slide a little bit. The overall title is general now. Um, how do polyunsaturated fats work? Because the first paper deals specifically with omega-6s and not omega-3s. So it's still a polyunsaturated fat, and this paper wanted to see when you gave rats a diet of um, high N6 polyunsaturated fats, does that change insulin sensitivity, and can that be related to a change in DAG and ceramide content? Next, paper C moves into humans. We want to see, can we see results of omega-3s in humans? These are healthy humans. We want to see, does omega-3 um, change fat oxidation and or improve insulin sensitivity? Next, we would want to move into a diabetic or obese population because that's really what we're trying to fix, right? So if we could give fish pills to diabetic people and if they had beneficial effects, then maybe that's an easy answer to fixing obesity and diabetes. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of research in this area yet. It's on the go as we speak. Um, we can assume, though, that if there's a change in DAG and ceramide with omega-3s, Everyone just takes fish pills, and then problem solved. That assumes, though, that DAGs and ceramides are the main factors affecting insulin resistance. And so this last paper gets at that idea. Is it as simple as DAGs and ceramides? Or is there some other paradox that we can glean from these athletes in this latest athletes paradox study? So that's it for the summary from week four. Remember, these are the directions that we want to take the content this week. Um, bring any questions that you have to class or send me an email. Let me know what you thought about the summary. Thanks.